<clears throat> our Father and our God, we are grateful to you for this year's conference. Thank you for how you have brought us together and the way that you have arranged, despite all the challenges that came around us, to you be all the glory, to you be all the honor, to you be all the adoration. Thank you, God, for the time of worship as you used your servants to lead us. Again, we want to just bow before you this morning that your word will come to us with simplicity. Your word will come to us with clarity. Your word will come to us with impact. Our cry for revival is such that we will be part of another move of God in this generation. Holy Spirit, we are asking that you will stretch forth your hand towards us as we came upon them on the day of Pentecost. We ask that you come upon us again. You do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. I want to thank God for the privilege and the opportunity that God had again extended to us uh, to have this conference. And I want to thank the coordinating team uh, headed by our pastor, Raphael, who had been uh, pressing that we will have this opportunity again to speak the word of God. Today, we are focusing on the Holy Spirit in revival. Uh, just as he began to say last year, we were looking at passion for revival, the indispensable ministry of the word of God in bringing revival. But as we looked at the Holy Ghost, I mean the word of God, it became clear to us that no man can actually accomplish anything in the, in the kingdom of God by the energy of the flesh. And so I'm going to ask you to begin with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to read uh, a passage that we will anchor on as we introduce the matter of the Holy Spirit in revival. I want you to go with me to Zechariah. I know that's a passage you all know, but it's very important that we start from there today. Zechariah chapter 4, and I would like to read from verse 6. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, verse 7. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and verse 7. So he answered, said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, nor by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and it shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Now, this is a very critical passage which will underlie the various issues that we will be raising in the course of this uh, conference and tomorrow. We're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit in revival. And the first thing I want you to note is that this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to you. This is the word of the Lord to any man that wants to be used of God. This is the word of the Lord to every pastor. This is the word of the Lord to every servant of God. Actually, this is the word of the Lord to every, every believer. This is the word of the Lord. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Where you see Zerubbabel, I want you to please insert your name. This is the word of the Lord to you. Uh, what gives me great uh, boldness in approaching this conference this year is that the word of the Lord is coming to us. 
the word of the Lord is coming to my own heart. The word of the Lord is coming to me in a peculiar manner because I perceive that we are the threshold of another global manifestation of the glory of God. I perceive that something is about breaking forth beyond what we have seen before. We have seen God do different things in different places. We have seen God manifest himself through many, many of our brothers, sisters, ministers of the word of God. And we have had histories of the move of God in various times, at various places, with various, in various generations. But God is speaking afresh. God is speaking about an end-time revival, an ingathering of the harvest just before the appearing of the Son of Man. And there's nothing else that will be able to help us with this particular gathering except the latter rain. We have had the first rain moderately. We have had the move of God moderately. And some of you that have been students of history, you will know that at the beginning of uh, the, the uh, 20th century, in the 1900s, 1904, 1905, there was a wave of the Spirit of God that went all over the world. There was a wave of the word of God that went all over the world. Is it Azusa Street? Is it West Revival? And several other things that God did that gave impetus to where we presently are in the purpose of God. But God is speaking again. God is rising again. God is seeking to do a new thing in our generation. And this is the word of the Lord to you. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. I said, please insert your name there. This is the word of the Lord to you. You might be a young man, like, like Evan Roberts was a young person when the Lord came to him. You might be a young lady, as several young sisters were affected in those days. You might be a young pastor, you might be just inexperienced. This is the word of the Lord to you, not by might, not by might. God's work is never done by the might of any man. God's work can never be done by the power of the flesh, but by my spirit, says the Lord. No matter how elaborate, how overwhelming, the things that God wants to do in your life or the things that you perceive God is setting before you or the things that you are hearing in your heart or your spirit as regards the prophetic declaration of God concerning your life, may I say to you before I go ahead, this is the word of the Lord to you. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And if it is by the Spirit, if the Holy Ghost should come upon your life in a very deliberate manner, if you could come under an unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit for this time, then I want to say to you, you can challenge mountains. You can challenge mountains. Who are you, O oh great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And it shall bring forth the capstone with, with shouts of grace, grace, and more grace to it. When the Holy Ghost comes on a man's life, and when the Holy Spirit is the one executing the purpose of God in your life, mountains will melt before you. No matter how high those mountains have been, no matter how many years they have been standing, no matter how imposing they have been, when it is not by your power anymore, when it is not by your own wisdom anymore, when it is not by your might anymore, those mountains will melt before you. Those mountains will be leveled before you. And not only that, the Bible said, you will bring forth the capstone. You get to the climax of it. And when you have done that, you will see, be able to shout grace and grace to it. 
So as I go ahead this morning, I begin with the preambles that I wanted to set for this discussion, praying that the Holy Ghost will help us as we go on. In the pursuit for a fresh visitation of God on our lives, and in the churches, and generally in the nations, the anointing and the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit is cardinal. When I use the word cardinal, I want to say to you that there is no way we can achieve what God wants to achieve. We can get to the kind of thing God wants to do, particularly in this generation and at this time when sin has multiplied, where reckless living has become the order of the day, when governments of the world are sitting together, conniving together, standing against the purpose of God, when several legislations are being promulgated, uh, contrary to the word of God, when men are becoming more bold to, 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 to pursue unrighteousness, and they want to institutionalize it. There is nothing else that can overwhelm and, and raise a wedge against this flooding of the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, and all of you, you will understand with me now, that the enemy is closing in upon our earth like a flood, a flood of wickedness a flood of invention for sin, a flood of confusion. Right from the beginning, even small children from age five, they are being flooded. Their mind are being polluted. Everywhere they turn, the world system is squeezing things around and making sure that the knowledge of the holy has become obscure in our time. Now, the enemy has come in like a flood, my dear brothers. The enemy has come in like a flood, my dear sisters. The enemy is coming in like a flood everywhere, from nation to nation. But the Bible says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord, that's why I'm saying to you that what we are talking about is a cardinal need the anointing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon your life as an individual, upon our fellowships, upon our churches, upon our congregations, and upon our denominations, wherever we are located. Now, it said, the coming, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is cardinal. It's because only the Holy Ghost can raise a wedge against the overflowing of darkness. And if any of us are going to actually make impact, an indelible impact in this generation, it will be required. It will be required that the Holy Ghost comes upon your life in a very, very deliberate manner. The Bible said, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, said, no one can actually accomplish anything when the Spirit of God has not worked. Let us agree with that. I pray that that will become your personal conviction as it is mine. That there is no sincere work that can be enduring. There is no, since there is no genuine work that can stand the test of time when the Holy Ghost is not at work. There is no teaching, there is no explanation, there is no ministry activities that can prevail when it is not occasioned, when it is not orchestrated, and when it is not uh, generated by the Holy Ghost. And so the reason why we are focusing on the Holy Ghost this year and this time is because for any of you sincerely to do something that will be impacting. I'm not talking on making noise. 
I'm not talking about filling the place with empty activities that don't leave any indelible mark, but if in your heart you want to create an impact, you want your life to, to, to affect men, you want, you want your footstep, your footprints to become indelible on the lives of men, then you've got to be endued with power from on high. Where the Holy Ghost has not worked, may I say sincerely, no work is done. Where the Holy Spirit has not worked, whatever you see, whatever you think is happening, is only peripheral. It's only a camouflage. It can never stand the test of time. Now, though we must preach the word of God, it is imperative to preach the word of God as we studied in our last year's conference. Christ will not allow us to depart into the fields until we have been clothed with power from on high. Brothers and sisters, I want you to confirm that very quickly as we turn to scriptures. Can you go with me quickly to Luke chapter 24? I want all of you to please come along to Luke 24. And we're going to start from verse 46. Luke 24 and verse 46. Yes, I think we can begin from there. I just want you to note that even the Lord Jesus will not allow his disciples, his apostles to go unless they endure with power from on high. He himself never will step into his public ministry until he waited to be endured with the power from on high. No man should go into any form of ministry unless the only door has set you on your life. May I say to you, it is suicidal to attempt to do anything for God when you have not come under the power of the Holy Spirit. May I say to you, the stage in which we have reached, the, voras the veracity of the wickedness and of the rage of Satan that has been unleashed upon our generation demands that if you do not have the power of the Holy Spirit, please just withdraw, go and keep quiet somewhere. Otherwise, you will not only be a casualty, you will be seriously, seriously injured for your life. If the Holy Ghost is not going to come upon your life, then there is nothing to do. I am hoping that by the time we are finishing, each one of us in the course of this conference, wherever you are, whether you're in your house, whether you are in the, in, the, in the park, wherever you are listening to this instruction, I pray that it will dawn on your heart that this is an indispensable need of your life. And I'm praying that you will see what, I'm, what the need we are talking about beyond the empty activities. I'm praying that there will be an hunger in your heart to say, oh God, release unto me, release unto me a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit for me to confront my generation. Let me repeat what I've said. The Lord himself will not allow us, will not allow us to depart from where we are now unless we are endued with the fresh outpouring of his spirit from on high. Now, then he said to them, Luke 24, verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, let me quickly ask you to look at that passage a little quickly. I'm still just laying my foundation and I'm praying that God will you to come along. Now, the Bible said, it was necessary for Christ to suffer 
and to rise from the dead the third day. That was necessary. Without that death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was no hope for our redemption. There was no hope for our salvation. And there was not going to be hope for mankind. It was necessary. For the salvation of mankind, it was necessary for Jesus to die. As I say, even now, for the deliverance of our own people, for the deliverance of our own time, our own generation, whosoever you will be anywhere all over the place, it was necessary for Jesus Christ to die for you, to shed his blood, and to rise again in order for you to have the new life to live. There is no other way there's no other name given under heaven by which any man can be saved except this name, Jesus. It was necessary. Now, that is one imperative. The imperativeness of his death, the imperativeness of his resurrection, so that the basis of our deliverance, the basis of our salvation can be established. But then look at verse 47. It was also necessary that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It is also an imperative that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Brothers, I want you to know that it is necessary. It is imperative. It's an imperative. Repentance, remission of sins should be preached in his name, in the name of Jesus, to all nations, among all nations. All nations. When we talk of all nations, we are talking of all peoples, all tribes, all tongues, wherever they are located, in whichever part of the earth they are located, it is necessary that uh, repentance Remission of sins should be preached in the name of Jesus. Otherwise, there will be no hope for any man to make it to heaven unless he has come under the authority of the word of God that led him to repentance and remission of his sins. He said, we are witnesses of these things. Now in verse 49, and I said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Though preaching the gospel is very urgent, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was a necessity, but to be able to go forward with the message to create effect and to affect men anywhere and everywhere, he said, tarry until you are endued with power from on high. My dear brothers and sisters, if Jesus Christ, who sees the urgency of the gospel, the urgency of men being saved, if he says, tarry until you are endued with power, until you are clothed, I think, King James used the word until you are clothed with power from on high. Until, you know, it looks to me as if any man that has not been endued with the power of the Holy Spirit is naked. He's bare chested. If you are going out at all and you have not been endued with the power of the Holy Ghost, you are not clothed. You are naked. You are bare-chested. You are empty-handed. You are going to make yourself vulnerable to the wicked spirits that are ruling this present darkness. Now, not only that you are naked, you are empty, you have nothing with which to confront the hearts of men that are already congealed by the power of darkness. Now, 
when Jesus rose and the disciples gathered around him in Acts chapter 8, I mean chapter 1, I want all of you again to follow me to Act 1. Uh, I'm laying all of this so that we can get to the issues that we need to be dealing with today. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, the first thing I want to note again, just uh, laying the foundation of the necessity of human, of the power of the Holy Spirit in revival. The Lord Jesus Christ said, yes, yes. As they gather together, he said, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Wait for John truly baptize you with water. And brothers and sisters, there is no gain. Do not worry you that you have been baptized in water. You have been water baptized. That's good. But may I tell you, water baptism is water. It's water. If I were to put it in my, in my own intonation, I'll say, now water be that. If you have just been baptized in water, and that's all the certificate you are going about, I can see many of you, you just glaze your baptismal certificate and say, yes, I was baptized and I was confirmed. And maybe you didn't say you were confused. But all of that, John truly baptized you with water. And even when John himself was talking about that water baptism, he said, I baptize you with water. But there is he who is coming behind me the latchet of whose shoes I was not qualified to untie is the one that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There's a baptism that each one that wants to fulfill the purpose of God on earth must experience. And this baptism has to be with the Holy Spirit. So when the disciples said, so now that you are going, when will you return the kingdom to Israel? You said, that's not your business. It's not your business. It's not for you to know times of season with the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power for living, power for service, power to confront powers, power to subdue the kingdom of darkness, power to push the kingdom of God forward, power to advance the purpose of God in your generation only comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. No matter how energetic you may be, your energy is not anything when it comes to the power of the kingdom that we need to confront and the power with which we need to serve the purpose of God in our time. So I heard the Lord saying, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. And he said, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, 
Why was Jesus insisting about this? The challenge that has come to all of us, either as leaders, ministers, or teachers of the word of God, is enormous. While I don't want to scare you, but I felt that we have come to a very particular point in this present generation that what we need to be effective is not oratory. It is not uh, managerial capacity, even though all those things are useful. It is not good advertisement. You need power that subdues the heart of men. Power that breaks and melts the heart of stone in order for men to come under the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is such that we dare not approach what God has called us to do with human energy and carnal wisdom. While all our administrative trainings are very valuable, and they will prove inadequate for dealing with the forces that confront the church in this age. No one has actually been so called and sent forth into the spiritual battlefield with bare hands and ordinary physical equipment. Spiritual work and spiritual work cannot be done by soulish energy. Human emotions, talents, human senses, they are good, but eventually they will fade and fail anytime, except the Holy Spirit fears the man who serves God. Intellectual prowess, managerial competence cannot undo or confront the principalities and powers and the, 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 the wicked spirits that hold men and women in bondage, the spirit that block their eyes, that the light of the glorious gospel may not shine unto them. God is longing that if any man is going to walk with him, if any man is going to keep in step with him, he must do so by the spirit. Because the life that can overcome is only the life of the spirit. Is the life that is lived in the spirit. Is the life that is generated, resourced by the Holy Ghost. And if a man will not walk in the light of the power of the Holy Spirit, then he cannot fulfill the purpose of God in this time. Now, In this first segment of our study, our study is going to come in four messages. But the first segment today, I'll be looking at the Holy Spirit, indispensable requirement for ministry unto revival. And in this first segment, I intend about the grace of God I'll be looking at men who are endued with power from on high. Now, the reason why I want to go that way, first is to examine together with you the fact that all those who did anything for God, anybody who created an indelible impact upon the lives of others and upon the work of God, all of them, without exception, had to be endued with this power from on high. I know that by the grace of God, uh, since several of us have come into charismatic uh, Pentecostal experiences, the issue of speaking in tongues has become so common that even when the power of the Holy Spirit is not being experienced, many of us are satisfied. When what Pentecost did in people's lives, whenever the Holy Ghost came down on their lives, when you don't see such in your own life, but simply because 
you are now in an atmosphere where they speak in tongues and you are speaking in tongues and nothing has actually happened and changed, you feel satisfied. So that's why I want to examine men who are endued with power from one eye. What were the results that we saw in their lives? If I may be able to provoke you to follow me to the place where we knock on heaven until God pours afresh the baptism, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives again. Now, when we come back, perhaps tomorrow, then I will be looking at the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, the way He operates, the, the ministerial gifts, and all the various things that uh, the Holy Spirit operates in order to release the fullness of His power in ministry whenever people are uh, have been so end endowed. We're going to be looking at that as the law will permit us at this particular point. Now, we will need to deliberately look at such men, they are different of them, in different situations at different times, and either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, we have come to see that every man who served the Lord effectively, they had to wait to be and deal with God's power from on high. None of them was presumptuous to go in the energy of the flesh. Few of such examples are outlined here for our own in-depth studies. Our brother has already promised that you will get the study notes so I may not go in details because of the space. I deliberately prepare those notes so that even when we are finished, you can have something to work with, can have something to build upon, can have something to grow with as the Lord will permit us. Now, the first man I want to look at will be the story of Moses, the endowment of the power that Moses had in order for him to be able to fulfill the call of God on his life. Let me ask you to start by looking at Acts chapter 7. The story of Moses is quite elaborate, but we have to take summaries in order for us to trace the issues I want to raise in the course of this uh, uh, study. Can you look at uh, Acts chapter 7 and verse 22? Act chapter 7, verse 22. Uh, the, that was a summary on the life of uh, Brother Moses that we will be talking about as the Lord permits us now. Now, and Moses, I read from verse 22, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in words and in deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, he came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptians. For he supposed, please take note of verse 25, he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, or they did not understand. And the next day, he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? For he who did his neighbor wrong and pushed him away, pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Let me stop at that verse 27. I could go on to verse 29, but I just want 
to stop at that point first. Now, Moses knew the call of God on his life. When Moses came to years, he recognized that the reason why I was born is not to be a Pharaoh's daughter son. He knew that there was a destiny he was supposed to fulfill in his lifetime. Moses was not in doubt that there's a call of God on his life. This was why he left Egypt. This was why he left the he left, he left the palace. This was why he left everything that he used to have that would have become uh, something for him. He left all of that in order for him to fulfill the will of God. He went right into the field. He went to look at his brothers. He saw the kind of suffering they were going through. And he saw the challenges that came upon them. And he wanted to act. Now, let me look at the qualifications that he was depending upon very quickly. Look at what were his presumptions. Number one, we are told that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, may I say to you, no matter how educated you are, no matter how versatile you are in the philosophies of this world, no matter how much you can explain everything, everything, when it comes to confronting the kingdom of darkness, when it comes to fulfilling the purpose of God to release men from bondage, may I say to you, Education, as good as it is, is actually of little effect. The men that God had used to shake their generation, some of them are very educated, but majority of them, they are not so highly educated. And yet, when the power of God came upon their lives, they affected people all over. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egyptians. We are told Moses was mighty in words. That's to tell you that Moses was a great orator. He was a man who can express himself so clearly. He was a man who can hold uh, people, you know, spare band when he is on a campaign trail. Yet, there may be some of you listening to me and you think that because you can speak well, you're a good communicator, you can really uh, dramatize when you are talking, you might think that that is enough to bring conviction to the hearts of men. That would be a terrible, costly presumption or assumption. Now, he was, we're told that he was also mighty indeed. He was an activist. Moses was a very great activist. But we are noting that all this qualification that he acquired while he was in the palace was not sufficient in any way. Was not sufficient in any way to carry him or to lead him or to sustain him or to make him effective in what God was doing to him. Now, let me show you what he was trying to do. He went one day, and the Bible said, he saw one of his people suffer wrong. He saw the oppressor oppressing one of his brothers. And you know, something inside of him, the natural instinct said, wow, how can you do this to my brother? And so he engaged his energy. The Bible said, he, he, he struck down the Egyptian. He struck the man down with his, with his hand. And the man eventually died. And he quickly buried the man. And I imagine he went back home feeling nice. He said, yes, at least one has been, has been reduced out of the oppressors. 
Maybe he was thinking that he would do that one by one, one by one, one by one, and he'll be able to deliver his people from Egyptians. I was wondering if God were to wait for Moses to engage that kind of methodology, whether the children of Israel will have been delivered from Egypt even now. Thousands of years will have passed. I imagine that even Moses himself will have died and nothing will have been done. So he was confronted. God allowed him to be confronted with the emptiness, the weakness of what he carried. And the following day when he went, as he saw two brothers now fighting themselves, oh, he had assumed that the people would have known that God would deliver them by his hand. He thought that simply because he came from the palace, simply because he gave a testimony, I'm not Pharaoh's daughter's son, simply because he was highly educated, simply because he was a great speaker, simply because he was a, a, a great activist and he could really sway people. He thought that people would have understood and they would have take, taken pleasure that, oh yes, we have another man who is coming from the palace, he will help us. But that was a costly assumption. There are many of you that may be assuming that because you have knowledge of everything, you have several concordances in your house, and when you are asked to bring a Bible study or do a Bible teaching, you just go in and you just do all your research and you pull everything together and you're a very wonderful organizer of of facts, and that is making you feel as if you are okay. That's a costly assumption. All of that carried no weight. And as for, as for Moses, the next day he came, they asked him a very critical question. The young man said, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Where did you get your authority? Where is your power? with which you think you can, you, can, you can lead us out of this bondage. That question was the question that pushed Moses to go and seek the grace of God. I don't know whether some of you, you have not faced challenges that should have taken you back to seek God's face. Eh? When you are teaching the word of God, people argue with you all the time. Even when you try to explain and explain and explain and explain, the people say, well, that's your own opinion. You know that they are not convinced. You know that their lives have not been affected. You know that they have not become convicted at all. You just go. And sometimes you just preach and souls are looking at you like this. They are not convicted. You didn't hear them cry out. What shall we do that I will be saved? You are the one who started your message. You finished it. You are the one who prayed. You are the one who told the people to stand up, clap their hands. I'm surprised. God has never yet done anything to give a breakthrough. And you feel like continuing. No. When this happened to Moses, what he did was he ran away. He ran into the wilderness with one question. The question that they asked him, who made you? Who made you? I perceive he's asking God, if this is what you want me to do, if this is the call of God on my life, if this was why I was created, I was born, I was preserved, I was not allowed to die in River Nile in those days. Where is the power to execute my mandate in life? I wish you will not finish this meeting without you sincerely saying, Lord, I have been in the ministry for many years. Where is the power for me to execute my mandate in life? Where is the authority for me to carry out what you have called me to do in my lifetime? I wish all the challenges you are facing 
drives you back to God, makes you to go back and say, oh God, where is the power for the kind of assignment you have given me? This was what took Moses out. This was what took Moses to the wilderness. This was what took Moses to the house of, the, of, of Jethro. He was asking a question. And I would like you to note when God eventually came to answer that question. And I tell you, he took 40 years. Now, I'm not praying that we will be spending donkey years. But, you know, the first thing that taught me is that if it takes 40 years to be in deal with power from on high, to accomplish your ministry in 40 days, I tell you, it's better to wait. The Lord Jesus Christ was not going to rush out until he was sure that heavens were open to him. We'll deal with that eventually. But my cry, when I look at the life of Moses, I saw that here is a Moses. 14 years crying for the power of God. But the joy I had is that when the Lord eventually encountered him, and the power of God came upon his life in the wilderness, it did not take more than a few weeks for him to lead the children of Israel in mass out of bondage. In fact, Exodus took place in one night. That's what the power of God can do. We're going to look at that, but I want you to keep marking that. That when the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on a man's life, the result that you see is not commensurate with what human nature can bring about. It's not commensurate with what the, 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 the human wisdom can accomplish. Now, let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, very quickly. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus and chapter 3. I want to come from verse 1. I just want you to see a few things there. No time to talk much. But I want you to see the result of what happened when he has encountered God. The Bible said, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw, that he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, go to verse 10. I want you to look at verse 10. I'm just want to say, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of bondage out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? But Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You know why he said, who am I? 40 years ago, he thought he was strong. 
He thought he was qualified. He thought he had the credentials. He thought he could use his oratory. He thought he could use his uh, power, power of speech. He thought he could even use his energy that can kill an Egyptian and nobody will query him. He thought that that was enough to be able to bring the people of God out of the kingdom of, of, of darkness. Now, let me go ahead from that verse 15. Please follow me to verse 15. No, no, I want you to go beyond verse 15. I'll go to verse 19. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 19. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. If you pick that from NIV, NIV in verse uh, 19 and verse 20, I'd put it like this. Let's, let me read from NIV, if I can. He said, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Unless a mighty hand compels him. I know he will not let you go. He will not allow you to go unless a mighty hand compels him. This is God himself talking. God himself said, look, Moses, we am sending you, I know, the king of Egypt, the principality of Egypt, will not let the people go unless when compared by a mighty hand. And so I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptian with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Now, this is God himself. Saying to Moses that, yes, I want to send you. But the powers we are going to confront in Egypt will not let you go. The power in Egypt will not let you go. Unless a mighty hand compels him. Unless a mighty hand pulls him. He will not let you go. This was exactly like Jesus Christ says that when a strong man that has taken men captives, when he has locked his gates, his goods are kept. You cannot assess it unless a stronger man comes and confronts him and release the captives. We cannot hope to go and release men, the captives of the mighty, when we go with empty words, empty hands, it cannot work. So the question was that Moses came to a point where he knew I can't go unless the Lord will do something in my life. And I thank God that if you remember all the various things that God did in his life, which you can read on your own, until God changed the rod he was carrying and he became the rod of God in his hand. He became a means by which God was going to cause the purpose of God is hand to prosper. God even said, by this road, you will perform several wonders in Egypt and they will release you to go. Now, what is the result of the ministry of Moses when he had been endued with the power from on high? If you will join me, I want you to see what we wanted to note that chapter four. Please come with me to chapter four of Exodus. And we'll read verse 29 to 31. Exodus chapter 4, verse 29 to verse 31. Exodus, let's quickly check verse 29 to verse 31. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of Israelites. And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed these signs before the people. Verse 31. And they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and that God had seen their mystery, they bowed down and worshipped. Why did I need to note that? It's the same people that said to him, 
who made you a ruler over us? It's the same people. But now, the same people, they saw something invisible in the life of Moses. And for that reason, they believed and they were ready to follow him. They were ready to subject themselves to following Moses at this point. So again, are you struggling for leadership? Are you struggling with people to follow you? Maybe what you needed is not to be struggling to assert your muscle. Can you withdraw? And let's go to where God induced men for ministry. Let's see what God does when he brings a man up and endure him, how things become effortless. How those that rejected you before, they will now open up their hearts and they will receive you for what God has uh, been saying or wanting to use you to do in their midst. Uh, can you look at how uh, Acts chapter 7 gave a summary of what happens when a man had been anointed. Uh, chapter 7, verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Verse 36. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness, 40 years. This same Moses. My brother, you don't need to be anything. You don't need to change. You don't need to grow taller than what you are. What I propose you need is power from on earth. It is not that you didn't have more degrees. Even if you go now and get a PhD in theology, it will not make a difference. Yes, you'll be more educated. You may be more biblically educated, and that's all right. But in terms of whether it will cause demons to tremble, it doesn't, there's nothing about that. What you need is power. This same Moses, whom they rejected, and wherever you are, whosoever you are, have you experienced rejection in ministry? Have you been in a place that no matter how you struggled, the people never listened to you. No matter what you did, the people never agreed or accepted your ministry. And it's appearing as if you are going to be doomed a failure. Now, I want to say to you, you don't have to be a failure. If you will only withdraw to the place to seek the power of your most, the most high God, if you are going to come and so to say into a wilderness, until you are endued with power from on high, it will be a challenge. But if you will come in, it's the same Moses. Once God has now endued him, he was the one by the hand of God and by the mighty manifestation of the grace of God on his life that was able to lead the people again out of the house of bondage. He was the one that was able to bring them out and let them and all through in the wilderness for 40 years. The anointing that came on his life sustained the work and kept them going. Now, it's the same need that God needs to meet for all of us. For Joshua, when it was time for him to also step in, God said, put the Holy Spirit, put the Spirit upon him. Let the spirit come upon him also. A man cannot do anything for God unless he's endowed and endure with power from on high. Now, all the judges that God ever used in scripture, they were all men and women that sought this endowment. None of them could succeed if they were not anointed. None of them could get anywhere unless they were endued with power from on high. Now, you will remember Gideon. You remember Gideon in chapter 6 of Judges. His story, you find it in Judges from chapter 6. 
from verse 11 to 24, from verse 32 to 40. Gideon kept crying because of the situation in their country. They were under the terrible bondage of the Midianites. Even when they farm, they are never entitled to reap from their farms. Those who never farmed came and reaped their harvest. The Midianites would just come anytime. They raid the farms, collect whatever they have. And the children of Israel were seriously impoverished. If anyone would get anything, they do it in the night and quickly went to hide it before the Midianites came. But now, an angel of the Lord appeared unto, unto, unto uh, Gideon. And the discussion in the book of Judges chapter 6 will show you again that God can take an ordinary man. What matters is not whether you come from uh, a very prominent family in your clan or you have come from a very poor house. That's not matter. The matter is, is the Holy Ghost coming upon your life? Are you endure apart from on eye? That is the issue. And my dear brothers, dear sisters, wherever you are, the question that must be settled is not anything else. Have you been endued with power from on eye for the things you want to do? What aspect of ministry are you involved in? Have you been endued from on eye for it? Have you sought the face of God until the power of the Holy Ghost has come upon your life? Now, when in Judges chapter 6, Gideon was confronted with the challenge of what God wanted to do in his life from verse 10. The Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord your God, do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But because you people have not obeyed my voice, this was the reason. As the angel came and sat under the terebin tree, where uh, Gideon was threshing the wheat in the wine press in order to hide it. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, my dear brother, look at the question. The question that was probing in the heart of, 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 of Gideon. What was that? He said, where are the miracles? Where are the things that God did that our fathers told us about? Why are we not seeing that in our time? Why am I standing, speaking and speaking and speaking, and nothing is happening? Now, if you have such questions in your heart, I want you to know that God loves to answer such questions. He loves to answer that cry, that desire of your own heart. God wants to answer that prayer. It's because the hunger, the test for genuine anointing, for genuine release of the power of God is something that God himself is creating in your heart so that you can walk with him. All the men that God ever used, they came to that point and said, where is the manifestation of his power? Where is the Miraculous that our fathers told us about. Why is it? Why is it that we are just struggling and I'm getting no result? If such question is also bothering your heart, I want to tell you that you are a good candidate for the power of God. I want to tell you that God himself will not ignore the cry of your heart in this way. So what are we saying? This man said, I will not go unless I'm sure your power goes with me. 
and God did everything to empower Gideon. You will see that when he now went to face the Midianites, just blowing the trumpet alone, the power of God was already at work. Without shooting a gun, just by announcing the sword of God and the sword of Gideon, something happened. And the whole Midianites were discomfited. They began to face one another. They began to kill themselves. The children of Israel only went to gather the, the spoil. When God has anointed you, things happen effortlessly. When the Holy Spirit has come to walk in a man's life, we see results that we cannot actually explain according to human understanding. It is in the same way that people kept asking, what is the secret in the life of Samson? What made Samson unique? The Philistines, they kept worrying. Why couldn't we conquer this man? There were times they tried to arrest him, but he alone, with the jawbone of an ass, he could slaughter a thousand. And it is not because he has big muscle. It's not because he was a, a, a giant. Himself was not a giant. Samson wasn't a giant. It was not the muscle of Samson that was pushing down the giants. It was the spirit of God that was upon him. As you read your scripture, you notice the Bible said, and the spirit of God. Let me read that. Let's quickly go to Judges chapter 13. Please come with me to Judges chapter 13. And towards the end of that chapter, verse 24 and 25, you will see that what was the secret in the life of Samson was the only ghost that was coming upon him. 24, so the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Manane than between Zora and Eshtal. The spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. That was the secret. And everywhere, anywhere you read about something that was spectacular that uh, Samson did, you will always notice that the word of God we note that is the spirit of God that came upon him. Look at chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, Judges 14, 6, it says, And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, for he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. When the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, he could tear a lion with his bare hand. My dear brother, my dear sister, I'm pressing upon you this morning. I'm creating in you a cry. When I will be stopping for this first session, it will be to lead you to cry, to look at the importance of your life to look at the emptiness of what you are presently doing, to look at the vagueness and the lightness of your word, of your message, if not that you are used to shouting, if not that our, our congregation are used to making noise, if God were to allow you to see how dead, how dry what you are saying is, if we remove your noise, you will have known that you are like a minister from the cemetery. You will have seen how lifeless what you are saying looks like. But God is creating this opportunity for this conference that we will cry to God. There can be no revival anywhere except by the working of the Holy Spirit on the life of the man or the woman that God wants to use. It is as the Spirit of God comes mightily on Samson that all the exploits that he did were done. Look at verse 19 again, a recurrent issue. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. And he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of clothing to those who had ex explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused. You know, I was every time anything happened, it was by the Spirit of the Lord. Even though when you have time to look at something, he did not maximize that Pentecostal shower that was always coming on his life. He used it for selfish reasons. And he couldn't accomplish all that God would have wanted him to accomplish. But all the same, it is when the Spirit of the Lord come upon him, anytime that you see him causing a push, creating, you know, a victory over the Philistines. Now, when was his defeat? When was Samson defeated? When the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Moses, I mean, Samson began to speak, say, yes, I will stand up, I will shake myself. No. When power has left, men become noisemakers. When the Holy Spirit is not at work again, you have to do a lot of uh, acrobatics. I will shake myself. I will shake my body. I will do this. I will do that. Uh, let me tell you, if divine energy has become absent, don't worry. Go back to heaven and say, Lord, something is lost. Don't struggle to replace it with human energy. The sweat of a man cannot cast out the list of a demon. My prayer is that God will help you to touch this. Now, Saul, Saul, the son of Kish, one of the critical things that happened to Saul was the Spirit of God that came upon him. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, when you look at verse 1 and you look at verse 5 to 13, you will again see that it was when the vial of oil was poured on Samuel, I mean, that Samuel poured upon Saul that the Bible said he became another man. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And from that time forward, something changed about his life. Something changed about his life. I better read First uh, Samuel chapter 10. I'll read verse 5. I'll read verse 5. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Verse 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be turned to another man. My dear brother, you remain ordinary man until the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. When the Spirit of the Lord has not come upon a man, you are just a man. But when the Spirit of God comes upon your life, God turns you to another person. God makes you now a channel through which his blessing can flow and can touch others. Now, David was another man that God anointed. You can see his own story also. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. When the Spirit of God came upon him, towards the end of that chapter, they said, from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon David. That he went and confronted Goliath with an ordinary, with an ordinary sling with only smooth stones, and he cut off the head of that man, that was by the anointing. When the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on a man's life, what you do, what God uses you to do, is not commensurate with your effort. It's not commensurate with your personal uh, strength. It's not commensurate. What God does far, far, far surpasses the best that any one of us could bring in. Now, 
I have only said all of this to lay foundation that whether the kings, whether the judges, whether the prophets, every one of them, they had to wait for this endowment of power from the Most High. Everyone who became a prophet in the scripture, and when you have time, you can go and explore. They had a definite story of how he or she was endued with power from on high. Some will describe it as the spirit of the Lord coming on them in a vision. Some will say, and the word of the Lord came unto them. Others will say, the body of the Lord. Others will say, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Different terminologies may be used, but the experience was the same. So, while we are not going to spend time looking at terminologies of endowment of power, that's not our concern today. But wherever the Holy Ghost had come, wherever people have been endued with this anointing of the Holy Spirit, the result is always the same. The equipment of Jeremiah for the ministry he executed, the anointing coming on Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, they were all narrated for us, for our learning. We can only examine if we are going to do the path that Elisha took to secure this endowment of power from one eye. Our constraint is because of time and space. So I, I, I know you remember how Elisha, having followed Elijah for several years, said, let me have the double portion of your spirit. But once the Holy Ghost came upon Elisha's life, the result of his ministry was something else. The result of what God did in his life is something else. He led battles. By the grace of God, we can talk of healings. We can talk of strategic leadership. The, 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 the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom that was operating in his life, and all the things that they did, the striking issues about the apostles of power from on high, and the way they walk under the anointing are all the issues that I would like you to look at when you have your space. Now, let's ask, what of the Lord Jesus Christ? What of our Lord Jesus Christ? Go to Matthew chapter 3. I want you to quickly come to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, Matthew and chapter 3. Go to Matthew 3. All I'm dealing with this morning first is just to look at men. We're just exploring because I want you to note that there can be no revival in your life, in your ministry, in your church, in your congregation until the Holy Spirit has come. And I want you not to just presume like Moses who went out. The Lord Jesus Christ never presumed. Can we go quickly to Matthew 3? And in Matthew 3, I want you to see how Jesus, how Jesus was endued for the ministry he executed. Then Jesus came, verse 13, Matthew 3, verse 13. Jesus came to Galilee, from Galilee to John, at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Now, even when people thought that Jesus does not need to come for this water baptism, Jesus knew that what he was looking for was beyond water. In fact, the Bible said in Luke 3, that while Jesus Christ was being baptized, 
he was praying. What was he praying for? He was praying for an open heavens. He was praying for the Holy Ghost to come upon his life. He knew that he cannot confront the enormity of his ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you go from that chapter 3, when the Holy Ghost has come upon his life, you can now go to Luke chapter 4. Please follow me to the book of Luke chapter 4. Even though Matthew 4 will have reported it, but I want to uh, take it from Luke chapter 4. And I will just refer to a few verses and then we'll go from there so that we can uh, pray for this moment. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, can you go to verse 13? Please go with me to uh, verse 13 of chapter 4. He said, Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, in verse 1, Jesus returned from Jordan full of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. There's no time for us to talk about that at this point. We might deal with it when we're looking at how to authenticate the power of God on your life. But it is striking that the Bible says Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. I was wondering who spread the news. When a genuine anointing comes on your life, your publicity does not need, you don't need publicity. The anointing will publicize you. The way I see you spending so much, so much on publicity just to get attention of people. Can I ask you, can you return back to the place where God visits the people, to the place where the anointing flows? Now, when he returned, something significant happened in verse 17 and 18. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah as he came back to church to read. And when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Even for Jesus, all that he did, the reason is because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. You see, preaching is not just having Bible knowledge. Preaching the gospel is not just about having capacity to speak. Preaching the gospel is not because you are preaching equipment. You must be anointed to preach. There is an anointing that gives man capacity to bring forth the word of God and it will create effect. It will touch men. Now, Sunday school uh, teachers that you may be, outlines have been prepared and you could presume that since you have the outline, you can just go and be reading the outline and be repeating it. Nothing will happen that way. You must be endued with power from one eye. The only ghost must come upon your life so that the things that God wants to do will be done in your life. Now we saw that Jesus Christ had to be in deal with power from on eye, and you can see all of that. Now look at the priority that Jesus himself placed on the power from on eye in his own life. Look at how the fact that he will never send for his disciples until he has laid hands on them to receive the Spirit. If he did not give them power, they can't go anywhere. 
And in fact, when he was going, he said, don't go anywhere until you are in deal with power from on high. The apostles, they also have to wait because this matter is critical. Now, looking at each of these verses and the various situations in which the apostles or the prophets demonstrated their hunger and thirst for the power from on high, the practices, the lessons that we must learn from their lives as we also seek endowment with God from on high for effective ministry in the churches where God has made you overseers. Now, do you notice that the apostles, they don't think everything is correct until they have prayed and laid hands on people to be filled with the Holy Spirit because they knew Without the Holy Spirit, even the Christian life is difficult. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Christian witness, Christian ministry is ineffective. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that you can put together and it will work. As we will be talk, turning to God this moment, when we come back for the second uh, session today, I will be looking at steps we must take, practical steps. But this morning, can I ask you, have you felt empty and emptied? Have you struggled to see result in the ministry? Are you just speaking? You speak a lot, but you've not seen genuine conversions of souls. People come to shake hands with you, they say that's a good message, but their lives have not been affected. Have you been in a situation where you see dryness in your life, where you see emptiness in your life, where you see impotence? I want to say to you that all of that condition is a reason to come. It's a reason to cry to God and say, Lord, how can I go on like this? Moses knew the call of God. He was ready to run with the call of God. But he was not going to succeed. He was rejected. Because something is missing in his life. My dear brother, my dear sister, as we go to God in prayer, what is it that is missing? That except God will touch you, God will come to you, everything will not work well. We're going to invest this next few minutes just to pray. And I want you to deliberately open up your heart. Now, it is possible that what has robbed you, which when we come back later, I'll be dealing with, of the grace and the power of God. You used to know the power of God in your life before. But when you went into sin and wrong alliance, the spirit left you like he left Samson. Samson began now to shout, but the power has left him. He is no more in position to do anything. Those that ran away from him before, they are the ones that now began to molest him. They pluck his two eyes. He could do nothing. There's no power in prayer. And because we are not together, maybe you are just there with your wife or you are there with some children or some few church members, five of you, six of you, or you are alone. What a time to cry to God and say, Lord, I cannot, this conference must not end, leaving my head empty. When the dove is descending, looking for heads of men to descend, Lord, please consider my case. Lord, consider my case. You are sweating so much in the work of God, but there's little result. It's time to call on God right now. Will you please bow your head? And let's call on God together at this time. Let's pray. Please pray for yourself. Call on God and say, Lord, this is the first segment. And when we come back later, 
we are going to be looking at, so what practical step must you take? But can you present yourself and say, Lord, don't allow me to go dry. Don't let me just be struggling. Don't let the words of my mouth be falling down like empty, empty language. Lord, visit me. It took Jesus to go down to Jordan for that thing to happen to him. Whatever it will cost you for God to visit you, can you please come to God at this point? Let's pray. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to call on God on your behalf. But I wish you can lift up your heart to heaven and say, Lord, even this morning, I, 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 I'm seeing impotence. I'm seeing dryness. I'm seeing very, very serious drag in my life. I am seeing that I struggle and yet there's no result. I'm walking, but my hand is just piercing. Nothing, nothing to show for it. The church over the which I have been put has remained stagnant because there's no power for me to operate. I see demons dangling up and down before me and I have no power to overcome them. Lord, this day, do something new in my life. As you are praying, God will answer his prayer. He will do something on your behalf. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity for us to start this particular uh, conference. Thank you that you are showing us that spiritual work is not possible in the energy of the flesh. Lord, we are realizing that if you don't come to us, there's nothing in our hand to engage the flood, the overflowing influence of Satan and of the prince of darkness in this generation. If you don't come down, oh God, we've seen our youth becoming white. We have seen all kinds of theories that have overtaken the land. Father, this morning I'm asking that as many of your children as are beginning to cry and say, Lord, do a new thing in my life. Do a new thing with me. Lord, I ask that you will raise her for them. Begin to touch us. Let the heavens open, O oh God. Let the anointing begin to flow. As we will begin to study later on, how do we engage this? Holy Spirit, please come to our need, our, our rescue. Come to our help, come to our aid. Do a new thing in our lives. Visit your people one by one. From house to house, from row to row, from person to person, wherever they are. Let a visitation from on high come now. Let the heavens pour and outpour upon our soul in what you have called us to do. Thank you this moment. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. We want to really give praise to God for that wonderful uh, challenging session from our beloved uh, brother Gwile Akrami. And I just want us to just stretch our hand wherever you are and just pray, Lord, everything you have put in the heart of your servant to share with us at this time, Father, release it without reserve so that no man, no woman, no one under the sound of this conference will go the same way. Thank you for grace. We pray you refresh him, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Praise God. Uh, once again, we want to thank God for uh, uh, what he has delivered so far and believe in God that the sessions to come will be uh, more glorious, and that the word of God will locate us where we are in Jesus' name. We are in the session uh, segment of the program where we want to take some questions and answers, and we thank God for the questions that have come in, and I want to trust God that by the special grace of God, uh, the Lord will use our Father and the Lord uh, to attend to these questions. Praise God. I have three questions for you, sir, uh, from the brethren, and I would just like to read them one after the other. 
um, uh, maybe I read the first one, you respond, and then we take the next one. Praise God. The first question, sir, comes from a reference you made when uh, you were teaching. We saw in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 22, Acts 7, 22, how the Bible describes Moses as a man uh, full of skill, learning, and, and all that. Uh, and he was very confident. And from the teaching, we understood that uh, he, he, he was confident without having an encounter. But then when we turn to the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 20, Acts 4, 20, when he actually had an encounter with the Lord, as it were. He was afraid uh, to go and do the work. So, sir, how can we reconcile these two scriptures? We see in one, um, uh, uh, then we see in another where despite his encounter, I think that's uh, Exodus 4.20, not Acts, Exodus 4.20. We see after his encounter, he was so afraid uh, to go and do the work. So how can we reconcile these two scriptures, sir? Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, the, the confidence he had in the beginning was the confidence of the flesh mm. that could never have brought out any result. After 40 years of discovery, how impossible it is for the natural man mm. to be able to carry out anything from God. He had become so broken. So what you are seeing in chapter 4 of Exodus, chapter 3, chapter 4 of Exodus, was the manifestation of a broken, a contrite, and a meek man that has come to now know that if God does not help me, I cannot make it. It was almost becoming too much to the extent you say, send another person, I know I cannot make it. It was not, it was that he has now seen that all that he thought could have been his credential are not qualified. He forgot now that he was highly educated. He forgot now that he had a great learning in Egypt. He forgot that Egyptian language may have likely have become you know, an asset to him to understand what the Egyptians will be saying. All of those no longer matter to him because he has now seen the emptiness of himself that is needing the power of God. Every man that has ever encountered God sincerely, they only tremble onto whatever God calls them to do. If you are standing there so confidently beating your chest as if there's mm. something in you, personal to you, with which you can execute the call of God, I will be afraid of you. The man that God uses, all of them, without exception, they mm. trembled in touching the work of God. They all knew that without him, we can do nothing. Even Jesus said, without the Father, I can do nothing. This is the extent to which men that have realized their need of God, their need of power, that's the extent to which they go. So what you saw with Moses was the fact that now he had been evacuated of his natural strength. He had been evacuated of what could have been his self-confidence. He's now going to go with nothing but God and God's power in his life. Thank you so much, sir, for, for that, and, uh, and, and I believe that, uh, that that provides a very good insight into the situation that uh, Moses found himself before and after the encounter with God. The second question I have here is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, uh, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, where the Bible says it's not all those who say, Lord, Lord, uh, who uh, will enter heaven. And he said, some will say, Lord, in your name, we cast out devils. In your name, we heal the sick. In your name, we did glorious exploits. 
just as uh, you uh, have shown that no man, no woman of God can do exploits except by the power of the Holy Spirit, except by the endowment of the Holy Spirit. So the question is that if an individual has had an encounter with God and with the Holy Spirit, how is it possible that having had this encounter and being used mightily for exploits, this same person can become rejected uh, on that last day? All right, thank you, brother. This is a very critical question. And the fact that it came from the mouth of Jesus, again, makes it very critical. That Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father from their heart. So that's the first key we see. A man may have an encounter. A man may be endued at certain point, but if he deviates from seeking the will of God on a day-to-day -day basis, if his own life and his own heart is no more, you know, uh, congruent with God, with the Lord Jesus, if he begins himself to go back to sin, uh, anointing does not guarantee your space in the glory of God. You see, the power that comes to demonstrate on people's lives and help people, as wonderful as it is, does not replace your own personal relationship with God. If your relationship with God breaks down, whatever you are doing, even if you are demonstrating power, eventually your life will cancel it. Your character will cancel it. So the Bible said, by their fruit we shall know them, not by their gifts. So when we come later on and we're going to be dealing with the operation of the gift of the Spirit, how the Holy Spirit operates, we might be able to have an insight And the man that is being so used has left his relationship with God. But may I say to you, just like Jesus said, he will say to them on that day, I never knew you. Even though you cast out demons in my name, you prophesied in my name, you did all of that, but I never knew you. Your relationship with me has broken. I don't know you. I don't know you. So you will notice that all the other men that actually demonstrated the power of God and it affected their generation, they are people that their first cry, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If you remember that Moses himself, at a certain point in his life, when God said, I'm not going to go with you people again, he said, ah, if you don't go with us, how are we going to be different from other nations? And the Gagasites, the Jebusites, and all the Parasites, they may fall before us. But that is not the issue if you are not with me. So this raises an, a question that for all the brothers, all the men and women who are serving God, can I check with you that you don't first measure the parameter of your relationship with God with things? You must check, um, is, is God satisfied with me? Am I, um, am I right with God? Because that is what will matter at the end. Anointing for service. If it does not help your life to work with God, both you and your service will be rejected eventually. You will not go far. So the first thing we are noting is that Jesus was dealing with the fact of the man's heart. You notice that earlier than before then said, these people draw with me with their mouth, but their heart is far away from me. So if in the guise of ministry, in the guise of uh, uh, activities, prophesying, your inner man has departed from God, 
that man is in danger. And we need to first of all say, go back home uh, and re repair your altar that has broken. Your relationship with God that has broken must be restored. Thank you, brother. Wow. Thank you so much, sir. That's, that is uh, quite, quite revealing. Um, fruits do not necessarily confirm relationship with God. The state of our altar does. Praise God. I have another question for you, sir. We saw earlier that uh, Moses went through a lot, and at the end of the day, God was able to break him down uh, after a period of 40 years. Now, the question is, uh, can we then conclude, looking at the example of Moses, can we conclude that God uses situations to challenge us uh, uh, to get us out of our comfort zone, just like the Lord used the challenge that Moses faced to get him out of his comfort zone. Can we then conclude that when we look through our life, when we come across those difficult, challenging knocks of life in ministry particularly, that could be God trying to challenge us to uh, come to a place of a cancer with him. Thank you very much. Uh, just like you have said, God is able to use any and everything in order to get the attention of his servants. God, sometimes, when he has been wanting to show you the need, the emptiness of your life and the need for you to come to him for power, he may allow people outside there to do things that will push you back and make you to cry back to God. So go use circumstances. Go use things to pull our ears. Even though what God would have wanted is to use the ministry of his word to speak to you directly. You know, I, I, I began to realize, I said, this is the word of the Lord to you today. It is not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit. But when you don't understand that, when you think that there's something you can use, at least even if God is not present, you can at least do something, then God will allow you to have a waterloo for your life. God will allow you to go down to the point of serious disappointment so that you can seek fresh appointment with God. Many of you have left your appointment with the Lord because you seem to be going up and down. But God, sometimes because of his love, he might allow you to be disappointed in all those that you have trusted so that you can return. And sometimes dryness in the ministry might just be God saying, my son, come back to the closet for a while. Let me sit over your life for a while. Let me show you how to do things different from what you are doing now. So what you do with your circumstances is what matters most. It doesn't matter the, who is involved in the circumstances or what is happening. It doesn't matter whether it's a church member that is uh, saying something against you. That's not the issue. You must be matured enough to go back and say, God, these drums that I'm hearing, are you not calling me back home for a, 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 a fresh revelation of yourself, a fresh encounter, and a fresh release of your grace? Sometimes, you have gone on a mission and you have been on the mission field for several years and there's no result. While it's okay that, yes, we can tell you and say, well, uh, some people can labor like that and they go, don't get anything. But when the Holy Spirit is urging you and say, this is not normal, go back, come back again. Let's say to the matter. 
Yeah, so circumstances are used severally by God to draw our attention to himself. Just as he did to Moses, he can do to any one of us. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and and may the Lord continue to increase your grace and anointing, sir, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have another question for you, sir. Um, in your teaching, uh, we, we understood that Moses was initially confident in himself and in his skills uh, until he had an encounter with God that helped him fulfill that ministry uh, that the Lord called him for. Now, the question um, I have uh, is that often we hear preachers talk about, oh, God will use you. And, and just as he needed the word of Moses, God will, will need something uh, from you to do what he wants to do. Sometimes they can talk about the Lord using the child boy or the widow to bring about the miracle. Now, uh, if we look at those kind of uh, teachings and what we have just uh, about, they need not to rely uh, on laughter ourselves. Uh, would it be uh, wrong, it be wrong? Uh, or would we be uh, kind of confusing people uh, if we say uh, God will use you just as you are there for don't work on getting skills or talents or things like that? Would it be a mixed message or would we be encouraging people to be lazy and not strive, not develop, not do anything because God does not use their skill? The anointing. The anointing. The difference. All right. Thank you very much. Now, please take note that what we have said is not that the capacities, the competencies of Moses was useless. We have only said it is inadequate. We are saying that it is not adequate for his assignment in life. And to be going to a battle, imagine that you are about going to kill a lion and then you carry a catapult with a stone. Your catapult may be good in killing birds and in killing lizards. But definitely, what you are carrying now is not good enough for your assignment to face a lion. That's what we are saying. Now, please get all skills you can get. But all those skills, they will not be useful until it has been broken by God to be used. The rod of Moses never became useful until God transformed it in his hand. It was not the ordinary stick that he was flipping about. God have transformed. You can imagine that when the thing fell, when he dropped it and it became a snake in his hand, and God said, pick it. He knew now that what I'm carrying now is dangerous if I don't handle it well. So our skills, we must continue to develop skills. If you are in position to study, please study well. If you can do any research, any divinity courses, please do everything. But at the back of your mind, keep knowing that they are useful only when the Holy Spirit comes. When the Holy Spirit has not come, none of it is of any use to you. So we must not put confidence in our skill, even though we must not be men that have not developed what God has put in your hand. But everything you put together until it is anointed, it's not going to be of any use. It's not going to serve the purpose. That's what we are saying. So please go to school, read, get all your degrees, and get more degrees as the Lord permits you. But when you have brought all of those degrees, bring it, bring it back, and put it, put it at the mercy seat. You remember what Moses told Aaron to do? When people are arguing with him about authority of ministry, say, all of you bring your rod. When they brought their rod, they placed it at the altar. 
overnight. And the rod of Moses boarded. That was what gave him authority. Bring all that you carry. Bring all your intelligence. Bring all your skills. Bring all your training. Let's put it at the altar before the Lord. The one that boards overnight, the one that sprouts with the life, with resurrection life, is the one that is useful. Any knowledge that is just dry knowledge, that has not boarded under the power of the Holy Spirit, cannot affect anybody. It can only be letter that kills. It can only be knowledge that pours up. When you come to what I'm I'm blessed you. Thank you.